Welcome back. I'm That Chemist, and today we're going to decide which base is best. We have a couple of really special bases in this list, so you better stay tuned. So the rules for today are that the bases that go in this list have to be relatively common. Some of these are somewhat obscure, but they're common enough that they made the cutoff. So we're going to rank a total of 50 bases today, so buckle up. We're going to be considering the utility of these as a base, not as their utility as a reagent in general in terms of other purposes, solely as a base. Now we're not just ranking them in terms of which base is the best, we're also ranking them in terms of utility, like what type of transformations they can do, etc. So without further ado, let's get started. Let's pick a nice easy one like sodium carbonate. Sodium carbonate is nice because you can quench acids with it, you can also do a number of synthetic transformations with it. Now the disadvantage of sodium carbonate is that it generates CO2 when you use it, and that can be desirable because you can see when it's neutralized, but it can also be undesirable because things can overflow fairly easily. So most of the time when we're using a carbonate base, it's typically potassium carbonate. Sodium carbonate's also accessible to the amateur chemist just through the heating of sodium bicarbonate to a high temperature to drive off CO2 and water. So sodium carbonate's not terrible. I think we're going to put it in B tier. It's not too strong of a base, but it's okay. Now with potassium carbonate, it's got to be at least A tier because it's got added utility in that it's proven itself. There's so much literature using potassium carbonate as a base for alkylation reactions, it's definitely proven itself. Let's pick an obscure one. Maybe let's look at potassium fluoride. So you might be surprised that fluoride is on this list, but it turns out that you can actually use metal fluoride, specifically the alkali metal fluorides, to form bifluoride. Bifluoride is 1H with two fluorides, so KHF2 would be potassium bifluoride. So this can actually be used as a base in some applications, especially those using HF. It can also prevent etching to some extent. Now, most of the time we don't work with HF because HF is terrifying. And so that given, given that, you know, we're not gonna give potassium fluoride too good of a rating. It's also not soluble in too many solvents. So we're gonna put it in F tier because there's fluorine in it. Let's pick a nice other one like diisopropyl ethylamine. Diisopropyl ethylamine, also known as, known as Hunig's base, is quite a common base in organic chemistry. It's nice and volatile. It's got a relatively low boiling point, so you can rotovap it off fairly easily. But it's also not too nucleophilic because those isopropyl groups prevent it from being able to be too good of a nucleophile. So this is a good base. It's commercially available, very ubiquitous. Hunig's base is going to go into S tier. If we look at another one like 2,6-dimethylpyridine, the reason that this is used is because it's a sterically hindered base. A more common name for this reagent is lutidine, or 2,6-lutidine, and this can be used as a base which is a little bit, you know, similar to pyridine, but it doesn't tend to have the same issues as a nucleophile. It is still slightly nucleophilic, so it doesn't have all of the advantages that pyridine, or that another analog of pyridine has. So best case scenario, because this still is somewhat nucleophilic and is able to get uh, coordinated to metal ions and such, we're going to put it in B tier. Now, if we look at another one like this uh, derivative here, where we have two terputyl groups and a methyl group in the para to the nitrogen, this is actually a much better base because it can't coordinate metal ions. There's only enough room for a hydrogen to get in there. So this analog would be slightly better. We're going to put this one in A tier. Let's pick one like N-methylmorpholine. N-methylmorpholine is a base. It's a tertiary amine, so you can use this to scrub acid generated in reactions. This sees a little bit more use in MedChem than it does in the research lab as a base. It's still fairly nucleophilic. It has an N parameter of about 16-ish. So you might have to worry a little bit if you're using this in alkylation reactions, but it's weaker of a nucleophile than some comparative tertiary amines. So I think this one, it's kind of useless. We're going to put it in E tier. Now, if we pick one like this interesting naphthalene with these two nitrogens on it here, if you've never heard of this before, I'll give you a second to guess. This is called proton sponge. I've mentioned it once or twice on my channel before, and here you can see that these two nitrogens are getting crammed up right next to each other. And so these methyl groups, they're sticking out. They don't really want to be close to the other nitrogen. So this is a really basic base, even though you'd normally think of an aniline as not that strong of a base. It's been known for quite a while. Um, I would still say it's a little bit expensive in terms of cost, but it can be quite useful. So I'm going to put it in A tier. Pyridine is dirt cheap. Yeah, it's really nucleophilic though, and that's not desirable for a base. You want a base that can be just basic and hopefully not too nucleophilic. Uh, it's kind of hard to get rid of it when you're using it, um, but it does have a place in all of our hearts. So I'm going to put pyridine in B tier. Now, if we look at one like calcium carbonate, calcium carbonate is a great base. If you ever don't have a base in the lab to quench some acidic solutions, you can just run and get some chalk from a neighboring classroom if you're at a university. 
And if you don't have access to chalk in a university lab, you can probably find some rocks that have calcium carbonate in them. So calcium carbonate is a nice poor man's base. So the disadvantage is once you quench acids with calcium carbonate, you tend to have insoluble calcium salts, which might be desirable, but in most cases it's not in a research setting. It's normally only used to really quench reactions you don't want to do stuff with. Now you can make calcium carboxylate salts, which could be useful for the synthesis of symmetrical ketones, such as that of acetone, which is used to make acetone prior to the development of the cumene process. So calcium carbonate, quite a cool base in terms of having some utility for making acetone, but it's still relatively useless, so I'm going to put it in E tier. Now, if calcium carbonate was in soda, I think we'd have a different say, but in this case, we're mostly looking at bases, and because, uh, because soda is a very acidic, none of these are going to make that cutoff. But speaking of soda, why don't we look at water? Water's in soda, so it can go right to S tier. So I apologize in the previous video on acids, I forgot that water was in soda. Uh, how could I forget? Of course. So this is to make it up for water this time. Sorry about last time water, I hope you'll forgive me. Okay, so this one Dabco. This guy's Dabco. Uh, the reason we call it Dabco is because its full name is too long and we don't like long names in chemistry. I mean, we like them, but we don't like saying them. We only like copy pasting them. So Dabco is pretty useful. It's extremely nucleophilic though. And so if you leave Dabco in dichloromethane, it'll actually just alkylate one of the nitrogens to make a chloromethyl quaternary ammonium salt. So in terms of having like excess nucleophilicity, that's not too great if you want to use it as a base. But that being said, it can still be used as a base for some transformations. Dabco is pretty cheap. It's available. It's a white salt that's easy to weigh out without too many issues. I'm going to put Dabco in C tier. Let's look at some convenient ones. So potassium hydroxide, it's been a base for a really long time, useful in making soap. However, that involves its utility as a nucleophile, not just as a base. So potassium hydroxide compared to like potassium carbonate, it's a little bit stronger of a base. It also doesn't generate any gas when you quench stuff with it. And I think all of the alkali metal hydroxides belong in S tier. So why don't we put potassium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide, and lithium hydroxide all in S tier. Now lithium hydroxide's got a little bit more synthetic utility in terms of it's a little bit better at being a, a nucleophile for cleaving stuff, but in this case we're only considering utility as a base. Now cesium hydroxide's the one exception. So cesium hydroxide is not going to go into S tier, and that's because it's extremely hygroscopic, and that just means it'll suck water out of the air, and it'll form like a, a wet solution. And so this is just a little bit of a learning point. When I say hygroscopic, People often say hydroscopic, but it's actually hygroscopic. So cesium hydroxide, because it's hygroscopic, it's going to go in B tier. <clears throat> Triethylamine. Triethylamine is a very common base. It's probably one of the most common bases used in organic chemistry, but it does still have some issues with uh, being a nucleophile and getting alkylated. So because it's got some undesirable properties in that sense, it's going to take a hit to points a little bit. It's still really volatile and easy to remove. It's easy to wash out of solutions when you make it. So triethylamine has to go in A tier, even though it smells really awful. I hate the smell of triethylamine. Potassium terpetoxide, awesome base. It definitely is able to fight outside of its weight class. Potassium terpetoxide is super, super good as a base, even though terpbutanol has a relatively low pKa compared to some of these other bases in their conjugate acid form. So potassium terpetoxide, definitely S tier. The only disadvantage that potassium terpetoxide has is it can get wet, and then essentially you're just dealing with potassium hydroxide and terbutanol. So to prepare it fresh, you can do that with potassium hydride or potassium metal, um, although those are both kind of sketchy to work with. Another alternative is you can just store it in the glove box if you have access to a glove box. So potassium terpetoxide is pretty good. Sodium bicarbonate is great. You know, we use it in baking powder as baking soda. So it's a pretty useful, uh, you know, consumer product. As a base in chemistry, it's fairly weak. You can deprotonate carboxylic acids, but not touch phenols. So that's pretty impressive too. It's got some utility in buffering solutions, so that's that's can be desirable as well. I think that potas uh, that sodium bicarb belongs in S tier, even though it's not that strong of a base. It's just such a useful base. Maybe we'll take it down just to A tier because it does generate CO2 uh, when it reacts with acid. Now with the other two carbonates before, um, what I didn't mention is they also may not produce CO2, depending on how uh, acidic the conditions get. You might just use this as a base and then it's actually acting as both carbonate and bicarbonate, depending on what's going on. But in the case of bicarbonate, if it's reacting as a base, it's forming carbonic acid and that's gonna release CO2. Okay, 
let's look at one like phenolithium. Phenolithium, it's probably one of the first organolithium bases we're talking about here. The problem is it's fairly nucleophilic, and it can also abstract halogens. So it isn't just a base, it can do some other stuff, which isn't necessarily desirable for a base. When you're using a base, you want it to specifically be a base if possible. You don't want it to do other chemistry uh, if you're trying to do a deprotonation. So even though it's a pretty good base in terms of like benzene having a relatively high pKa compared to phenolithium, it isn't as good for selectivity. So I'm gonna put phenolithium in like D tier. Secbutylithium, it's a little bit better, less, uh, less of a nucleophile, more of a base. Could be useful for eliminating stuff, but it still does some lithiations. I'm going to put sec butylithium in C tier. N butylithium, such a good base. Yes, it does other chemistry, and for that reason, it's going to stay in A tier. Now, T buly, a little bit terrifying to handle, very terrifying to handle, but it is like the best base. And if I didn't put T buly in S tier, you guys would leave like a million comments. So I'm going to put T buly in S tier. Okay, let's talk about quinuclidine. So quinuclidine is like Dabco's daft brother. He's got issues. He's only got one nitrogen, so he thinks he's special. Um, but it's really hard to get a hold of this because it's commercially available, but in high demand. So there's a very low supply. And so in one of my projects, in my paper in Orglet, which I'll include a link to in the description, I used quinuclidine as a nucleophile. And so this isn't a story about its use as a base, but it's a good story, so I'm going to tell it anyway. So what happened was we had ordered about a gram of this. I think it was like a couple hundred bucks and it took months to arrive. Like it was like five or six months later before this stuff arrived and we were getting near the end of the project. We weren't even going to include it in the scope, even though we knew it was an amazing nucleophile for this reaction. And I just couldn't, I wasn't going to wait any longer. And then one day it arrived, there was like a Thursday afternoon or something that I wasn't busy. So I decided, okay, fine, I'll just do this reaction, get some clean product. Awesome. Now, I was visiting a research group, and uh, this is a, a well-known research group. I'm not going to call them out here. But when I was visiting their group, they had been doing some chemistry using quinucleidine. And uh, I told them how it was a struggle to get this stuff because it took like five or six months. And almost everyone in their group all laughed while I was giving this presentation. And so afterwards, I asked, so what was so funny about quinucleidine? And they said, oh, well, our group basically bought all of it in the last year. We bought everything that every vendor sold. And then we ended up having to buy some from a, some sketchy online Chinese chemical supplier. And then when it arrived, it was labeled as something like sodium carbonate or sodium benzoate. Uh, and it was pretty dirty. But after one recrystallization, they were able to get several hundred grams of this stuff pure. And so uh, that was a little bit humorous because they just consumed all of the supply of this reagent because they really needed it in their chemistry. So... Because of its uh, lack of supply and its difficulty to handle in air, I'm going to put it in F tier. But it's pretty cool looking in terms of being a bicyclic molecule. Now, sodium ethoxide. Sodium ethoxide is a really good base. It can still absorb water like all the alkoxide bases can, but it's pretty useful in organic chemistry. Now, it is still an alkoxide, so it can still be a nucleophile, but most of the time, alkoxides are going to try and act as a base if possible. They tend to be pretty good bases compared to their nucleophilicity. So I'm going to put this in A tier. Now, sodium methoxide is similar in terms of strength. However, it's not quite as commonly used because it can also do some transesterifications and stuff where, like, of ethyl esters, and methyl esters could just be a little bit problematic. So it's still a little bit too nucleophilic. So we're going to put sodium methoxide in C tier. But it's a still pretty useful reagent. Just it's not the perfect base. Methylithium would be a good base, but it's so small and nucleophilic that it tends to act as a nucleophile more often than not. There are cases where you could use it as a base, but those tend to be fairly hit and miss. Now, for a lot of these, you can also do CH lithiations, which is something I hadn't mentioned. And because n buley is pretty good at CH lithiations, I think I might actually move n buley up to S tier. t buley can as well. It just kind of matters on conditions. So there's this base here, which is a base on its own called tetramethylethylene diamine, or T-meta. This can be used as a base, but it's also frequently used as like a ligand. And it turns out that if we combine this with N-butylithium, we have an extremely basic butane anion. And so you can often do CH lithiations of arenes when combining N-butylithium with T-meta. So I'm going to put these both together in S tier because they're so useful together. Methylithium can be used in a similar way, um, but it's still like a decent nucleophile. So let's put methylithium in E tier. And I know you guys are going to give me a bunch of hate for that. And that's okay. DMAP, 
DMAP is a good base, but it's an extremely good nucleophile. Like it's so nucleophilic that you don't want to use this in a reaction unless you're trying to use it as a nucleophile or a nucleophilic catalyst. So I'm going to put DMAP in F tier. Now, if we look at some other ones like LDA, LDA is like the best base. It's so good in, in terms of being strong enough to deprotonate most protons that you'd ever want to eliminate, um, like in terms of eliminating a leaving group for E2. You can make lithium enolates with LDA. It's so useful. So I think we're going to have to put LDA in S tier. It's not that good of a nucleophile. There's instances where it could be a nucleophile, but it's just such a good base that we're going to put it right in S tier. Now this funky looking molecule here is called spartine. Spartine is this tertiary, di-tertiary amine. It's actually a natural product. It's an alkaloid that's derived from plants. And it can be commercially available, but its supply comes and goes. And so for a few years, uh, a while back, it was really challenging to get spartine. And so this is another one I would have liked to include in our paper in Orglet, but unfortunately we couldn't get our hands on pure anhydrous stuff at the time. So this is more often than not used as a ligand as well. So as a base, it's you know less commonly seen. So we're going to put spartine in F tier, but it's a really cool molecule. It's not because it's not cool, it's because it's not that useful of a base. Now, benzyl potassium. Benzyl potassium is made using terputoxide and N-butylithium in uh, toluene, and you can actually lithiate that position and potassiate that position ultimately with a combination of bases, where individually on their own, you wouldn't be able to deprotonate that proton. And so th this is made using what's called a Schlosser's base. Now, I didn't include Schlosser's bases in here because it was kind of hard to draw them, but benzyl potassium is made using them, and this is a really strong, cool potassium uh, base. So I'm going to put this in A tier because it's a uncommon enough that you don't see it used that often, but it's still a really cool base. Ammonia would be a good base, but it's still fairly nucleophilic. It's more nucleophilic than water. Uh, it's also hard to handle on its own as a base, so you're usually using it as ammonium hydroxide, and then you're wondering if water will be the nucleophile. More often than not, if you're using ammonium hydroxide, uh, the ammonia will still be the nucleophile, and it's just important to consider that like ammonia is extremely nucleophilic. If you look at end parameters between water and ammonia, ammonia is just so good. So ammonium hydroxide, pretty good nucleophile. It's not really desirable as a base, but it can be used occasionally. I'm going to put ammonium hydroxide in to F tier because it generates... Uh, free ammonia when you treat it with more base, even though it's a base on its own. Ammonia can also just go on its own into F tier. Now, if we look at this one, this is uh, a guanidinium base. And so guanidinium bases are actually really good bases. I think this has a pKa when protonated of around like 28-ish, depending on the solvent. I think in acetonitrile, it might be like 28, 26. Really strong base, so this can be good for deprotonating alpha positions of carbonyl-containing compounds. And just in general, you'd be surprised how, how good of a base this is. So you don't see this as commonly used in academia, but you occasionally do. It's more of a common thing in industry. So I'm going to put it in B tier for that reason, but it's still a really good base. Definitely worth considering using. Now, a more common one that looks similar is DBU. DBU is a great base. You can do horner wadsworth emmons reactions with it. You can deprotonate alpha positions of very acidic uh, protons, uh, of like carbonyls and stuff. And so pretty, pretty useful base. I would say that DBU is one of the more common ones, similar to triethylamine. And while people consider it a non-nucleophilic base, if you look at its end parameter, it's still relatively nucleophilic. It just so happens that the adducts that it forms aren't that stable usually. So it's still relatively nucleophilic, uh, despite what Wikipedia might say. So I'm going to put it in B tier, but it's a pretty good base. Like I, I probably love it as a base more than I like triethylamine, but you know, fair enough, right? So potassium hydride, sodium hydride, and lithium hydride, really good bases. A little bit too good of a base. They don't tend to do anything as nucleophiles usually on their own, so they're pretty good as bases. And for that reason, I'm going to put all of them in S tier, because they tend to only act as bases. And hydrogen is a great uh, leaving group, right? So once hydrogen's gone, bam, you can usually have a really clean, deprotonated species in your reaction mixture. So I, I'm a big fan of all three of them. Now, lithium hydride is a little bit more obscure, but sodium hydride and potassium hydride are really useful. However, they can burn down labs if you're not careful. Now, lithium HMDS, it's kind of like LDA, a little bit bulkier. Uh, another very, very useful reagent, especially for uh, lithium enolate generation, uh, as well as just protonation, deprotonations in general. So I'm going to say lithium HMDS is similar to LDA and probably deserves to be in S tier. Um, and so I'm just going to put it up here. Now, DBN is like DBU, but instead of having a seven-membered ring here, it has a five-membered ring here. And so the total number, instead of being 11, ends up being nine. So this is just a non-ane instead of an undecane. So DBN is like DBU, similar in terms of uh, reactivity as a base, 
It's a little bit less commonly used, so we're going to put it in D tier. Now, imidazole, super useful base. It's used almost all the time in organic chemistry, especially for like TBS protections of alcohols. Imidazole is nucleophilic, but it's not that nucleophilic. It's a pretty sucky nucleophile overall. If you deprotonate it, it becomes really nucleophilic. Um, but it's like a decent base. It's got decent organic solubility, easy enough to remove. It's a pretty good base. I think imidazole probably belongs in S tier. But because I haven't had to use it that much, I'm going to put it in A tier. But it's pretty close to S tier. Actually, we'll put it we'll put it halfway in between because we did that last time. That's it's fair. We'll do that. Cesium carbonate, uh, a little bit more expensive because cesium's not that common. It can be useful for specific transformations, and it can be superior to sodium and potassium. You'll occasionally see in a base screen cesium or lithium carbonate will outperform the traditional alkali metals. Now, cesium carbonate has better solubility. Cesium salts in general tend to have better solubility in organics. So it's pretty cool, but it's a little bit obscure. So we're going to put it in C tier for cesium. Lithium TMP. Lithium TMP is a really bulky lithium amide base. It's not usually your first choice. It's one you screen, and then when it works, you just justify that it's common enough, so you use it. So for that reason, I'm going to put it in B tier, uh, just because it's slightly obscure. Not too obscure, but slightly obscure. Triphenylphosphine. You might not think of phosphines as bases, but they are quite basic. Now, the disadvantage with triphenylphosphine is it's extremely nucleophilic, and it will also coordinate metal centers. So in terms of utility as a base, I think triphenylphosphine should go in F tier, um, especially since it starts with a pho sound, just like the letter F. Okay, lithium carbonate. Lithium carbonate's great because it doesn't have that good of solubility in most organic solvents. And so if you want to avoid side reactions and you want to reduce the amount of free base you'd have in solution. Lithium carbonate can be really good for that purpose. We've had reactions in our lab that worked really well because lithium carbonate was used over other bases. I think lithium carbonate's pretty awesome. I'm going to put it in A tier. Now, sodium amide is like the E2 base that you always learn about in introductory organic chemistry, but no one really uses it because it has really sucky solubility and it's usually too strong of a base. Plus you generate ammonia, which can do stuff as a byproduct but it can be prepared by amateur chemists relatively easily just by dissolving sodium in ammonia and then evaporating it. So it's accessible. However, it's a little bit, you know, too strong and too difficult to handle, not that soluble. We're going to put it in C tier. So this is uh, potassium neosilane. This is a really good potassium transfer reagent. It's a really, really good base. I haven't personally used this one, but people in the Discord were a big fan of this. So for that reason, I'm going to put it in B tier. If you've used this before, let me do, let me know down below what type of transformation you've done with this. The other cool thing is the byproduct that's formed is tetramethylsilane, which is super duper volatile. So we got two left. We got tetrabutyl ammonium hydroxide and sodium acetate. So tetrabutyl ammonium hydroxide would be nice, except these butyl groups have alpha protons that can easily be deprotonated and undergo Hoffman elimination. However, this can be useful as, uh, you know, organic soluble base, which a lot of these bases that would be similar in terms of base strength might not be as soluble in organics. So, you know, it's decent in terms of having some utility, but it's also going to be hygroscopic. But if you're using this as a base, water would be generated as a byproduct anyway. Tetrabutyl ammonium hydroxide is kind of middle of the line, so we'll put it in D tier. Now, sodium acetate, sodium acetate is good because it's a buffer, right? It can be protonated, it can be deprotonated a little bit. You can also use it as a very weak base to just push a reaction that just barely needs a little bit of a base to go. I think sodium acetate's pretty good also because it's on salt and vinegar chips, so I'm going to put it in S tier for salt and vinegar. So hopefully you've enjoyed this episode of uh, tier list ranking all the bases. It would really help out the new channel especially if you left a like and subscribed and shared this video with friends, and I hope you've enjoyed this, and I hope you have a great day.